um, and satisfaction that we're not hugely adrift from our timetable. My relief is that not only do I want to hear from the panellists who have come here to comment specifically, but I want to ensure that there's plenty of time to hear from the floor and also plenty of time for you to go and get a drink at the end of the session so that there's a, a package to deliver here and it's my job to try and deliver it. Um, as you'll have gathered um, from the introduction, I'm Alison Brimelow. Um, I have uh, an interesting and varied background in IP, but not a lot of it in copyright, but I am re-engaging at speed um, when I'm not doing other things that people in retirement do. I'm delighted to welcome um, the panel who have sort of slithered in, um, and could you just, I think, from the end, say who you are for those who don't know you, um, and then I suggest if you make your comments starting at the far end and moving down this way. Um, I was doing my maths in all of this. I think you've got between six and ten minutes each, and I'm pretty brutal about timekeeping. You have been warned. This is important because we want to hear from a lot of people. This is about hearing as well as saying today. Okay, from the far end. I'm Dominic Young. I'm Chief Executive of the Copyright Hub. And uh, I'm Robert Ashroff, Chief Executive of PRS for Music. I'm Jim Killock, the Executive Director of the Open Rights Group, which campaigns on digital rights. I'm Theo Bertram, Head of Public Policy and Government Relations for Google in the UK. Right, well, I think off we go then. Well, I mean, I wish I hadn't sat here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is entirely random. <laughs> I know, it's, I'll remember not to sit at the end next time. Um, I, I was thinking about this, and I, and I was fascinated to to hear the presentation, because it made a lot more sense to me listen, listening to that. Um, and I was, I was wondering about the, the question. It was, a, it was a funny question, really, in a way, because um, you can sort of split it up. One is, is file sharing a good or bad thing? And the other one is, illegal is the illegality aspect of it, something which we should or shouldn't be worried about, I suppose. Um, and actually, yeah, the Copyright Hub is, is largely attempting to do something which, in the terms of this study, I suppose would be called technical utility. It's trying to make licensing easier and therefore creates um, alternatives where the reason for illegal activity is because the legal alternative is, is difficult or impossible. Um, but actually, it's really easy to make an unlawful thing lawful in the, in the area of, of file sharing and copyright, which is the rights owner just needs to say it's all right. Um, it's, it's quite simple. And, Usually, if somebody is in the business of creating work and putting it out there with the intention of people consuming it, then their, their, their default is generally that they want to say yes to people having access to it in some way. Usually, in the world of copyright and licensing, um, yes comes with, with conditions, yes, yes if. Sometimes they're commercial. It's interesting that, <coughs> I can't remember which slide it was on, but one of them specifically mentioned sales as being the, the sort of influencing factor, but there's lots of forms of value that get exchanged in return for, for licenses. We, we know, for example, that Creative Commons licenses um, have conditions. There is an if on a Creative Commons license, nearly all of them. It's just not a financial one. Um, you know, it's not if you pay me, it's if you do other things. Credit me, don't change my work, or whatever limits someone, someone chooses from the menu of available Creative Commons licenses. And if you're in the commercial world, there usually is an if that's <coughs> that, that, that is financial as well. But financial outcomes are not the only outcomes that people look for in return for permission. But if you're doing something illegal because you can't get permission, there's, there's, there's probably one of two reasons, maybe, maybe three. Um, the first one is somebody doesn't want you to do it. They want to say no. Um, the, the, you're not willing to agree to their, their ifs, their, their conditions. Um, Another one is it, it's just not practical. You don't know who to ask. The, the, the nature of the conversation you need to have with them is, is so sort of clunky and expensive to have compared to the use you want to make that it's just a waste of time and, and, and you can't be bothered and there's no, there's no sort of sensible legal service set up. And the third one is that, that, that maybe, it's, maybe, maybe the thing was never there to be shared in the first place. I, I think probably nearly... Uh, I, I would be... This, this is, I'm very unacademic, so I, I'll just... I'll just um, make up statistics and, and hope that they feel about right. Um, but I, I, would, I would hazard that the majority of work created to which copyright applies is also private. And when people uh, use the right to say no to use of their work, actually what they're doing is exercising a, a, a privacy right as opposed to a, a, a commercial one. And so sometimes people just don't want you to. So if the question is, um, 
Well, if one of the questions implied by this is should the law change to make things that are currently illegal legal because people want to do them, and I'm not saying, I mean, obviously there's no conclusion reached on that, then I'd, <coughs> I'd say that's probably the wrong question. The right question is how do we make it easier for those who seek permission to ask the question and to receive the permission, the yes, the no, or the yes if, which is the most likely response they're going to get. And fundamentally, that is what the Copyright Hub has, has been set up to try to do. It, it, it has no particular sort of ideological view other than within the law, um, copy, copyright is, is a pretty successful thing. You know, it's very interesting, Martin's introduction, it's 300 years old, fundamentally pretty similar now to, to what it was then. It simply says if, if, you, if you create something and it's yours, it's up to you to decide what happens to it. And uh, one of the reasons that I perceive why there's so much illegal activity, only one of the reasons, is that, is that the process of exercising that right <coughs> to say what happens to your work is actually rather difficult. In the, in the digital era. It's very easy to copy things and pass them around. It's very difficult to track down the person who, who owns them or controls the rights to them and then get permission. And it's still a process that largely happens manually, actually. Very often you end up making phone calls and sending emails. And if all you're doing is sending a file to your mate, that seems like an awful lot of work and probably a lot more cost than the actual value of the transaction. So I, I would just say, I think improving the capability of the rights that copyright gives creators to be exercised by those creators in the ways that they choose is, the, is the, the big challenge for the future of the way copyright works and the way the creative industries work, and that's the thing the Copyright Hub is trying to create. We're, we are, we are pro-copyright, but we're not ideological about the ways people choose to use it, um, other than the rights that you are given as the creator of something, as, as, as the owner of a piece of property is a right that you should be able to exercise uh, in the way that you see fit. My observation is that that right has given us an incredibly diverse media with thousands and thousands of organisations competing for the attention, time and money of consumers and a massive choice for consumers. So it seems to work quite well in the interests of consumers and making it work better in the digital sphere and era is, is the big challenge facing us and that's the one that we're trying to address. Thank you very much, and admirably succinct. Um, so Robert Ashcroft again, uh, PRS for Music. I'm very interested in the, the fact, first of all, that there were so few of the studies uh, on the willingness to pay methodology. And, uh, <clears throat> and certainly most work has been done on sort of trying to evaluate the impact of uh, lawful file sharing on sales. But one of the things that struck me reading the report about the willingness to pay methodology is that, it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but there appeared to me to be a hidden assumption that the supply of music is a constant. And uh, that bothers me somewhat because my concern is for the functioning of the market and uh, the reward of the creators. And without a market that functions to give them reward, then the supply of music runs the risk of drying up to some extent. Um, the, I, I guess I'm also surprised that we should uh, conclude that further research is to be done on the, uh, uh, on the sales side because uh, as far as I was aware, at least before this report was published, uh, there was an awful lot of work that had uh, been done and I'm certainly aware of uh, the uh, study done by Stanley Leibovitz uh, who had said, uh, if I can quote from him, the file sharing literature has focused mainly on whether file sharing has decreased record sales with less attention paid to the size of any decline. Although there's still some contention, most studies have concluded that file sharing has decreased record sales. What has not been noted is that most estimates indicate that the file sharing has caused the entire enormous decline in record sales that has occurred over the last decade. This heretofore hidden result is due to the lack of a consistent metric that will allow easy comparability across studies. The task of this paper is to provide such a metric, translate the results reported in the literature into that metric, and then summarize the results from this exercise. So the conclusion, therefore, was the kind of decline that we've seen here in the UK from 1.2 billion to just over 750 million uh, can largely be explained by unlawful file sharing. So coming at this from a practical businessman's uh, standpoint rather than that of an academic and coming here 
uh, from the standpoint of trying to ensure the livelihood of our members, then it would appear to me that the answer from most studies is pretty evident. Um, this is causing harm. The last time that Theo and I shared a platform, although we weren't physically present, was when we had jointly commissioned some research um, into the, uh, the, the ecosystem of uh, unlawful fire sharing, and we had that work done by Detica, a division of uh, BAE. And that essentially, uh, the essential conclusion of that was that piracy was a business. Um, we drew slightly different conclusions from it. Um, uh, uh, Theo will speak for himself on his conclusions. Mine were that this is a business where people are making a lot of money uh, out of not paying for the content that they ought to be paying for. Uh, we both agree that this, there is a follow the money strategy to strangle this supply, stopping advertisers, or at least giving advertisers the information that enables them to avoid advertising on illicit sites stopping the credit card companies making means of payment available to uh, unlicensed businesses. And I think that since the report was published in 2012, there's been quite a lot of progress in this country uh, on that. Um, and we have seen uh, the decline in the overall business sort of plateau uh, since then. But it seems to me on many levels that there is evidence that says that unlawful file sharing does cause harm. And I'm very surprised, therefore, to see the conclusions that we're unable to draw that conclusion from this comprehensive research. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Hi there. Uh, so I thought this was a rather good paper. I thought the uh, best bit about it was probably the way it shows the skew of evidence to be to do with music um, and also widening out, out the notions of what kinds of uh, harm and welfare we're looking at. I think that's a, what kind of utility we're looking at and the way that that suggests then strategies for dealing with the question. I think all of that is very, very helpful because um, policy makers uh, as well as business want to uh, see more lawful sales and greater licensed uh, revenues. That is uh, undoubtedly a good thing from an economic point of view, even if it isn't the whole story about this problem. Um, but I think that in as much as this uh, study gives a good range of responses and suggests a range of techniques that might be used for both business and policy makers to think about the problem, that's very, very helpful. Um, on the, a few people have alluded today about an ideological question. Um, I'm just going to say something on that because I think there's, you know, there's a sort of unspoken thing going on there. I don't think the debate that ideological debate is about pro or anti-copyright, or in as much as it might be, those people are not in this room. Um, they, you know, they're just simply not in this room. And the, the, the debate rather has been between uh, people who are worried about the future of copyright and copyright industries, legitimately worried about those concerns, and those people who, on the other hand, are worried about the impact of enforcement and perhaps the extent of copyright in terms of length of copyright or the lack of exceptions or something like that. And those that but that second group of people to which the open rights group belongs, people who are some who are occasionally concerned about the impact of enforcement measures on things like human rights, due process, questions like that, um, those people often are portrayed in a rather uh, in a slightly different light. And I just want to reject that notion outright because uh, I think it's extremely helpful if we all understand that ultimately we're on the same side and perhaps then this evidence today can be used as a way for all of us to discuss this uh, in a relatively rational and progressive and helpful way. Um, and one, thing I'll, other, one other thing, a few, few things about what this study doesn't do, which, you know, and, and I don't mean to, that as criticism, but a few things that I, um, I, I think are worth mentioning. Uh, one is the, has been the use by policymakers of proprietary evidence in this space, uh, by which I mean evidence where you can't uh, interrogate the methodology that underlies the results. And we saw that used a few times in the Digital Economy Act debates. I think policymakers should have a simple rule that any evidence of any kind where you can't disclose the uh, methodology uh, that comes up with a figure, that should be simply disallowed 
in terms of policy discourse. And that would force, that would, that, would, that would encourage, let's say, um, people who wish to produce evidence from a commercial point of view to be absolutely fully clear about how they've come to their conclusions in order that that evidence that they produce can legitimately be used in public debate and weigh in in a way that is sensible rather than uh, obfuscatory and scaremongering. Um, secondly, I think, you know, sort of, I think probably um, because it doesn't exist, and I think it's worth thinking about the impacts of the enforcement measures and what kinds of uh, study uh, might be put on the other side, if you like, of, in terms of the measures that have been put in place to deal with uh, unlawful file sharing. So um, the obvious uh, way that most, most unlawful file sharing is used and people try to reduce it is through greater licensed works, it's through the sale and use of platforms, that's where I think most of the uh, positive effect has been, um, but equally there are measures that have been put forward including uh, blocking of websites, uh, targeting users in various ways, um, copyright trolling by groups like GoldenEye, um, and of course uh, questions around what kind of legal uh, redress is available or not to uh, rights holders who want to see their rights enforced. I think all of those questions would be worth looking at, and I think they're a, a, a key part of the unlawful file sharing debate. Um, also already mentioned has been, and I think is a kind of a useful uh, benchmark in this, is what has the impact of legal file sharing been, in fact? Um, I think, you know, there are platforms like Vodo where um, documentary makers, people who've got a social message to put forward are having, you know, they're reaching new audiences, bigger audiences, they are able to distribute their work cheaply and effectively. Uh, I think, uh, you know, and obviously that has large social welfare benefits uh, without having any of the adverse effects of uh, unlawful file sharing. And just in terms of your study and understanding the impacts of unlawful file sharing, I think it's worth studying what the benefits of purely lawful file sharing are in order to understand what the impacts either way on of unlawful file sharing might be. Um, so I think that's most of what I've got to say. I think, as I say, the object here is to in increase access to material production and creation. Um, commercial production is a very important uh, part of that, but equally we also need to remember that social production uh, needs to be encouraged, if, not, if, if only to help fuel the future of commercial uh, production and platforms, because it's often the grassroots stuff that feeds up into the big commercial successes of the future. Thank you very much. A bit about um, Google's perspective, and then um, I'll talk a bit about the report. I usually find if I don't talk about Google's perspective, then um, I have to answer the same questions again and again afterwards. Um, so it's almost like the kind of disclaimer at the beginning of uh, any statement I make on copyright, which is that Google uh, is committed to supporting the creative industries and absolutely committed to tackling piracy. And uh, we've supported uh, the the film and music industry to the tune of a billion dollars through YouTube over recent years. And on copyright takedowns, I think we now take down around uh, 25 million URLs a month, and we do that at an industry-leading pace. And uh, uh, we work very closely with organizations like the BPI, in fact, and others to make sure that we do that as effectively as possible. Um, so uh, that kind of health warning over. Um, uh, I'll come on to the report, and Martin, you kind of invited us at the beginning to be uh, challenging and provocative, so um, I'm going to be a bit challenging and provocative. Good. So um, there's a few things that I, c I mean, I think the report is great, and, I, 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 and there's lots I could say that's really good about it, but I'm going to take issue with the things that... that um, uh, now, the first thing I would say is, uh, and maybe it's because this hall kind of me makes you sound like a vicar pre preaching from the front, <laughs> But I, I, I felt it was the, the, the overall view um, of uh, industry and government's approaches in these spaces was a little bit holier than thou. Um, and you know, the, it, there is, um, you know, it, it would be easy for me in a way to, to agree with the report and say, yes, the big problem with the copyright debate over the last few years has been the BPI's data, it's all wrong. Or to say, yes, it's all the other side's fault. Everyone commissions this data and they commission it specifically for the reason of trashing us. But our data is all perfect and uh, everything we've commissioned is, is spot on. But, uh, but I, you know, I, I don't think that's, um, 
if, if ever that was a kind of um, caricature of the uh, copyright uh, debate, I think in recent years it has moved on. And uh, I think you know, the work that we did with PRS was challenging for all of us, and I think it was data-driven. Um, uh, it was us and PRS, the BPI, the Premier League, the Publishers Association. We took data from uh, Detica, and it was uh, entirely objectively done. Um, and actually, we kind of didn't really have a conclusion because we didn't want to each draw separate uh, uh, views from it. I mean, clearly industry and government and the different parts of industry come at the issue from different perspectives, but I don't think that means we can't agree on the data. And I think one of the, one of the good areas of progress that we're making at the moment between um, uh, all sides of that is a kind of a agreement on it being a data-driven approach. And if you look at something like the uh, Ofcom survey, you know, the Kantar Media report that they do fairly regularly now, um, you might draw different conclusions from what the data means, but at least there is a kind of shared agreement on the value of that data. Um, and, 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 you know, and it was also, for, for example, kind of, you know, that, that one of the things you were drawing out was the idea that, um, uh, uh, that, that music uh, shouldn't be treated in the same way as uh, different types. And I think that's something that kind of is self-evident to us already, because the conversations that we have, the way in which we deal with content, the way in which we, uh, we see this happening, we know is different. So if you um, uh, want to, uh, you know, if someone is uh, trying to get hold of the next Premier League match, um, it's a very different experience than if they're trying to get the latest album from someone because a Premier League match only appears at a certain time and is much more likely to be streaming and the whole ways in which that is promoted is, is entirely different. So, so we see that and we know that from our own experience as well. Um, on, on the methodology, um, it's interesting, I mean I think there are lots of good survey, surveys that are done using this methodology from medical science where you look at over the years at the different reports that have been done and you know I, I remember looking at there was one that was around um, how repeatedly over a number of years uh, journals had shown up um, uh, that protein kinase uh, reports on protein kinase had had an inc you know a, a correlatable incidence with reports on uh, uh, on uh, uh, problems in pregnancy and infant mortality and this was the way that the, that the researchers were able to conclude that there was a that, that maybe there is a connection between these two things. So it, it, was a, it wasn't something that was discovered in the lab, but through a research of the literature over time. And so I can see why, kind of looking back over literature over time and all these different surveys, what does it tell us about what we're studying? But the reason why I don't think it works quite so well with the topic that we're looking at is um, that the human body doesn't change um, or doesn't evolve very fast, certainly not at the pace at which um, the industry that we're in evolves. And the studies that you would have had from five or six years ago would virtually be out of date now in terms of, 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 of the, you know, the, the way in which uh, content is shared and delivered and, and also how it's pirated. So it would be interesting, I mean, I, obviously, you know, I'm at Google, I would love to see this animated in a, in a nice GIF as well, if possible. Or is it GIF? I'm never sure which, which is it. <laughs> but um, but if, what I'd be interested to see is, like, how do those bubbles change over time? Um, and if you cut it year by year, is one of the reasons why we see the music being bigger because music has just been pirated for longer, uh, or has been you know, had more of a, an impact for longer. I, I think movies and, and TV is, is, is you can correlate kind of piracy. I think with um, the speed of download and people's access to it, it's it was always been a lot easier to, to pirate music because it's smaller file size and easier to share than, than a big film. Um, so it would be interesting to see kind of how does that change over time. And even kind of, you know, the, the, the term file sharing already feels, you know, fairly out of date. You know, the, the conversations that uh, Eddie and I from FACT were having this morning were all about streaming. Um, and, and there was a kind of sense in which, you know, that you know, downloading already feels like something that was, that was uh, some era ago and, and we already moved on. And, and so I think part of that is what creates the big challenge that we have. Um, uh, in trying to kind of to make sense and, and, and just to come to your point finally on evidence 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 I agree that we do need um, more uh, uh, we need we need evidence that we can all agree on it, it, and we need evidence that is kind of neutral and we may not agree on kind of what does that mean but but I would also say that we we're not with a dearth of evidence there is a fog of evidence the problem that we have is you know I mean 
you look at all of the, you know, as, a, as a business, you know, if you're PRS, if you're Google, you just have so much data. And it's trying to work your way through that to understand what is happening. And particularly with the pace of change in this industry and the volume of consumers that we're dealing with, the amount of content. Um, and, and kind of finally, I guess, you know, my challenge to, to you and, and, to, and to create is you know, that the, the, this is a great academic study, but the, the, you know, the, it, within that fog of evidence, we know there's a fog of evidence, and we know that, that sometimes it's very hard to tell what is the definitive outcome, what's the causal effect here. But that doesn't stop, uh, stop the fact that we have to act. You know, we have to do something. And if you're government, you need to do something about it. And if you're PRS, you need to do something about it. And if you're Google, you need to do something about it. So how do we move from, uh, you know, I agree we need longitudinal studies, but we also need to act now. The problem is kind of immediate. So those are the challenges I've put your way. Theo, uh, and indeed all of you, thank you very much. As it is, as, uh, um, the PAC chair, I have a lot of sympathy with what you've just said. Uh, um, and I think that, that the difficulty, and I'm Tony <coughs> Clayton at this point, difficulty for policymakers in a sector that moves so fast and where indeed there is so much evidence but also contest is to work out exactly what makes sense uh, and in what order you, you respond. And legislation is notoriously um, slow, uh, even in sexy areas of policy. I don't know whether copyright is sexy or not, but uh, yes, I think so, Tony's saying, um, unlike other bits of IP, which definitely aren't. Um, thank you very much to the panel. Um, I'm particularly thank you because you've given us lots of space for people to contribute. Before I move on to comments from out there, would the panel like to comment on what you've just heard from the panel? Uh, sorry, the, the authors like to comment on what you've heard from the panel. Daniel. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I feel we received some very constructive feedback and uh, some of this feedback is particularly helpful because I'm sure it's going to help us uh, uh, write our next grant application. So it will be uh, especially helpful in identifying uh, uh, the next steps in terms, of, in terms of research. So I will just answer a few points and then I'll give, uh, I, mean, I think I'll let Stephen answer some more, but very briefly. Um, so. Uh, most definitely there is a, a benefit, there is, there is certainly an issue about uh, um, accessibility of the legal content and therefore absolutely to what the extent that we can make that easier, uh, that is definitely going to help, uh, that you know, indeed relates to, to technical utility. Um, in relation to uh, the um, in relation to uh, the, the, the comments about uh, uh, the difficulty of, uh, Theo, this is relative to your comment about uh, you know, the difficulty of, of dealing with, uh, with data in an ever-changing situation, it kind of reminds me of something that Albert Einstein once famously said. And Albert Einstein said that the reason he became a physicist was because social sciences were too hard. <laughs> uh, it kind of reminded me of that. Um, so, um, yes, absolutely, uh, we live in an ever-changing world and the, uh, the pace of technical change makes it uh, harder. Uh, you're absolutely spot on in terms of interesting uh, lines for future research. I think that's, that's absolutely spot on. Uh, for example, how do the studies change with time? or for example, streaming, the incre ever increasing importance of streaming, and how do we deal with that uh, in a context in which uh, we actually need to make sense of it for policy purposes. And true as well, that we're a bit like in the conditions of, of doctors, and doctors need to treat the patient, even if you don't quite know everything about what is happening with the patient. So I think that's also a point absolutely well taken. Um, my sense is that there is, that there is uh, useful research that can help with that understanding that has not been done. Part of the problem has to do with all the gaps in that cube, really, uh, and identifying where the key differences lie, where we suspect that they, they do lie, um, and also exploiting some of the methodologies that are now available in terms, for example, of combining behavioral experiments that can help with causality uh, 
with, uh, with natural data, and there are ways of, of doing that. And I think there is a lot of potential there to try to identify causality in a better way than, say, in an Ofcom study, type of study, uh, in survey type of study, in which you simply ask about state, what, you know, stated behavior in the past, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, there are lots of limitations there, for example. Um, now, about the uh, comments uh, about, um, um, you know, the fact that there are a lot of studies that, uh, I mean, there is a lot of common understanding now that, I mean, a lot of the work, you know, is, does not have a secret agenda. Yes, absolutely. I think that's absolutely agreed and understood. Um, and I think that that's important, that we all work together to get a better evidence base. That's absolutely true. Um, Stephen, do you want to answer some of the points? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I think there's three points I want to pick up on. Um, the first one is, why is it we say, we can't definitely say that there is an effect when other studies have? Um, the second is that uh, we're talking about the blocking of websites, so I might make a brief comment on that. And finally, in terms of the value of the methods that we adopted. Um, so to assess why is it that we say um, that we can't necessarily say that there's a definite um, negative impact upon sales and file sharing when the review you pointed out, I believe, was Stan Leibowitz. Mm -hmm. And what he, those two issues or big differences. The first, of course, is that he looked exclusively at music. And I think we do say in the report that the predominant effect in terms of music is that there may be negative file sharing. But we, partly we also look at other industries where the evidence is far more ambiguous. But there's also the effect that in that study by Leibowitz there were two additional problems. The first is that um, what he doesn't necessarily discuss that I think we do a little more is the limitations in the type of data and the different types of models which are used. So yes, the studies that have been used have identified these negative correlations, but they're almost exclusively just say with physical sales, whereas we're saying, well, actually the dynamic effects are much more interesting. I think you said yourself, we need to know what's going on in terms of music production as well. And that literature is very much in its infancy. So what we really need to start trying to do is to develop empirical studies which do look at content creation as well as necessarily just sales, but we also need to look at sales in terms of not just physical sales, we need to look more at online sales, we also need to look at the new and different business models that are coming out in terms of, say, um, you know, Kickstarter, Pledge Music, things like this. Um, I think there's um, a study in the US where they're looking at all of the different ways you can make revenue from music, and almost none of the studies that we've examined have, you know, begun to scratch the surface of the different ways you can make revenue from music. So this, I think, is one of the reasons why we're saying the evidence is ambiguous, uh, it's partly because they just looked at music, it's partly because we're also discussing the other ways in which the evidence is limited. Um, in terms of um, the blocking of websites, I just thought it was worth um, discussing very briefly that there are a few studies on this and they tend to find similar effects as the introduction of new laws, which is there is an initial shift in behaviour, um, but generally we tend to find that under novel file sharing tends to be fairly habitual. Um, if you do unlawful file sharing, often your reason for doing so is because, you know, over time there's an initial reason you do it and then you do it because it's what you're used to. So if you close down your favorite website, often there's an initial period in which you shift to legal sales and you learn a new different website. But perhaps, perhaps some of those people who shift to legal services in their interim, because it's a habitual behavior, will stay on legal services. So there's certainly more evidence we could try and explore for that because, again, a lot of the literature on that is somewhat limited. Um, but I thought it was worth commenting on anyway. And finally, in terms of the value of the methods, um, I think there's a couple of things I want to say here. The first, in terms of how do we keep up to date, um, I would say one of the values of these more systematic type approaches is that they are phenomenally easy to update compared to almost any other review. So and again, if we think of the Leibowitz report, he excluded some studies on, you know, it wasn't entirely clear why some were included, some were not. Whereas if our study, you know exactly why anything that was excluded why it's there, and if you want to, you've got an Excel file where when it gets to the full text stage, so all relevant studies, you can see exactly why I did or did not put it in the review. Um, and you now, if you want to replicate what I've done or expand upon it, you don't need to begin where I did. You've got my search string, you've got my sources, you can easily update that. So if the literature moves on, you can use my work as a springboard. That is the hope. Um, so you can update this and keep it relevant. 
And one of the um, things we're talking about is comparing it to, say, a systematic review in the literature. So we're saying things change and it's much more nebulous in the social science compared to a human body which doesn't change. Well, that is why we adopted um, the scoping review rather than, say, a full systematic review. So the systematic reviews of medicine tend to um, adopt a very strict hypothesis and they test that hypothesis. Does this drug um, help blood pressure better than this other drug? Uh, we obviously have a much more um, diverse set of questions that we're trying to answer and therefore the scoping review methodology it's not so much about answer this one specific question it's what is the state of evidence that has been used to adopt this question and the real aim there is theory generation so the idea is if we've explored file sharing this way we've got a framework you could then make some predictions about what will happen with streaming how might this change you could then test those predictions by developing your own studies or assessing that literature so hopefully this this type of approach will help um, to address those questions, although I agree that obviously we can't do all of them at once. <laughs> uh, but I think that is all I wanted to add. Okay, I've, I've just got one more thing to add. Uh, I think my colleagues have covered most of the points uh, that I was going to go over. But um, I th it, again, it's about the, the changing industry issue, which I think is a very important one and, and a point well made. Um, but I think that it, the, the the fact that the technology changes doesn't invalidate our research or, or the research that has been done already because people don't change that much. So it's still going to be the case that if your friends file share, you're more likely to file share. Uh, and simil similarly, if you don't see any harm in file sharing, you're more, still more likely to file share. So th those uh, determinants that we identified are going to remain important and, and I think actually that they're definitely worth taking note of and, and thinking about what their impact will be on the industry.